When Anthony Quinn stepped into the spotlight in the 1950s, he was the image of male virility and self-assurance. This was a stark contrast to the more introspective figures of the era, such as Montgomery Clift, Marlon Brando, and James Dean. But in truth, Quinn was as filled with doubts as any of his more obviously troubled contemporaries. I couldn't have played Zorba before I went through psychoanalysis, he said of his most celebrated role. Zorba has a message for us. He tells us, don't be afraid of failure. I was terrified of failure. Quinn was a boxer, a painter, a polyglot who never felt he belonged anywhere despite his immense talent and intellect. This is the story of Anthony Quinn. Welcome to Hollywood Mysteries. Quinn's journey began during the chaos of the Mexican Revolution in Chihuahua in 1915. He was the son of Francisco Frank Quinn, of Irish descent, and Manuela Palades Oaxaca, of Mexican Indian heritage. Both were combatants in Pancho Villa's forces when Anthony was conceived, leading Manuela, affectionately known as Nelly, to return home. Quinn later explained, my father Francesco had the same problem I did, with people making fun of him because of his name and he joined the revolution to prove that he was a good Mexican. The harsh realities of war and poverty soon forced Manuela to flee to the U.S. with baby Anthony. They snuck onto a train, hid it in a coal wagon, and made their way across the border. It wasn't until Anthony was nearly three that the family reunited, with dad Frank and sister Estella arriving. Their struggle for survival took them across Texas and California, as migrant fruit pickers before settling in East Los Angeles. Francisco secured a job at William Selig's studio, starting by caring for the animals in the studio zoo and later training as a cameraman. From an early age, the younger Quinn was drawn to the arts. He also showed a keen interest in the church and considered a career as a priest. Given his extraordinary womanizing behavior in later life, this surely would not have been a wise path for him to take. But at the time, one particular moment affected him deeply. He explained that he was working as a shoeshine boy, aged just five, when he caught a glimpse of the inside of the church. I went in and I was absolutely amazed by the rituals. I fell in love with the Latin chanting. I asked the priest, can I ever get up on that stage? And he said, oh yes, you can. And he took me under his wing and I studied with him until I was 14. He was trying to make me a priest. As he grew up, his passion for drawing and sculpting soon took precedence, leading him to sketch movie stars he saw during visits to the studio with his father. He sent a sketch to Douglas Fairbanks, who surprised him by returning $25 for the artwork. But at nine years old, tragedy struck Anthony Quinn when his father died after being hit by a car. Resolved to support his family, Quinn juggled various jobs, from shining shoes to digging ditches and even taxi driving. He then entered the boxing ring as a professional boxer. This stint saw him winning a streak of 16 matches until a defeat prompted his retirement from the sport. His trainer told him he wasn't mean enough to become a serious fighter. Quinn also explored his musical side by picking up the saxophone and forming a band. He joined the Foursquare Gospel Church led by evangelist Amy Semple McPherson. He held McPherson in high esteem, later attributing the iconic gesture of Zorba's dramatically outstretched hand to her. He said, I have known most of the great actresses of my time, and not one of them could touch her. Simultaneously, Quinn was nurturing his intellectual pursuits. He threw himself into literature, music, painting, and also studying art and architecture. His architectural talents led him to win a competition, the prize being a meeting with Frank Lloyd Wright. The world's most famous architect and the young Quinn got along, and Wright took Quinn under his wing as he developed as an architect. In spite of the opportunity to work with one of the greatest architects in American history, 
Quinn felt himself drawn to the stage. Wright encouraged him to follow his heart. He advised Quinn to have surgery to overcome a speech impediment, but the surgery actually worsened his speech. This setback led him to seek acting lessons from former actress Catherine Hamill. An unexpected chance came when he was asked to replace a sick actor in a school play. He impressed everyone with his performance. This experience marked the beginning of Quinn's lifelong passion for acting. The next step would be away from school theater and onto the big stage. In 1936, Anthony Quinn took the stage in Mae West's production of Clean Beds. He was playing a role initially envisioned for the famous star John Barrymore. The evening held a surprise for Quinn when Barrymore himself attended the premiere, offering Quinn, then just 21, his compliments. Quinn later spoke about Barrymore, saying, Many people remember Jack Barrymore as either a wit or a drunk, but what impressed me was his courage of conviction. He used to tell me that you could only be as right as you dare to be wrong. Barrymore passed on his armor from Richard III to Quinn, who felt this symbolic gesture was like a matador bestowing his sword upon a promising newcomer. In the later years of Barrymore's life, he contended with severe cirrhosis and kidney failure caused by his alcoholism. Quinn would offer his support by donating blood on a regular basis to his mentor. Quinn's journey to Hollywood was set on course after his engagement with Michael Chekhov's acting school and his involvement in small theater productions. His early foray into film was a silent role as a fatally stabbed prisoner in the gangster movie Parole in 1936. Quinn's next film was a role in Cecil B. DeMille's The Plains Man, a Western epic starring Gary Cooper. Quinn's audition for the role of a chief was spurred by a newspaper advertisement seeking Native American actors, a tip he received from a close friend. Quinn, eager for the part, boldly presented himself to DeMille as a Cheyenne. He exaggerated his ability to ride horses and speak the Cheyenne language despite having no prior experience with either. As far as speaking, Cheyenne was concerned. DeMille was none the wiser, and the movie features Quinn speaking a completely meaningless and made-up language. The horse riding, on the other hand, would not be so easy to slip past the legendary director. In his debut scene, he was tasked with riding toward a fire, way beyond his non-existent riding capabilities. Quinn creatively chose to take cover behind a tree, arguing that it was a strategic move by his character to avoid detection by enemies. The situation escalated until Gary Cooper stepped in, backing Quinn's interpretation of the scene and convincing DeMille to adapt the shot accordingly. In the same period, Quinn tied the knot with Catherine DeMille. Despite being part of the DeMille family, Quinn found that his father-in-law did not actively promote his career. This restraint was partly to avoid any appearance of favoritism, and partly due to Cecil B. DeMille's lack of faith in Quinn's acting abilities. No doubt by this time, someone had pointed out the gibberish Quinn had been speaking in The Plains Men. During the years 1936 to 1947, Quinn took part in several lower-tier films, such as King of Alcatraz, King of Chinatown, and Island of Lost Men. Quinn described his frustration with being typecast as the villain, often not surviving until the end of the movie. I was the bad guy's bad guy, he lamented, usually meeting his demise through various means at the hands of the protagonist. Even in Cecil B. DeMille's Union Pacific, where he had a minor role, Quinn's character does not last until the finale. He continued to portray the adversary in films like Dangerous to Know, alongside Anna Mae Wong, and Road to Morocco, featuring Bing Crosby and Bob Hope. The entry of the United States into World War II in 1941 majorly impacted Hollywood. It also provided Quinn, not yet a U.S. citizen and therefore exempt from the draft, with opportunities for more substantial supporting roles. The year 1941 was one of extreme personal tragedy for Quinn. On March 15th that year, his first son, Christopher, wandered into the yard belonging to the Quinns' neighbor, the great W.C. Fields, who was on vacation at the time. Christopher fell into a lily pond and tragically drowned. The family was distraught, and Fields had the pond filled in, 
having been strongly affected by the loss. Quinn and his wife Catherine would have four more children, Christina in 1941, Catalina in 1942, Duncan in 1945, and Valentina in 1952. By 1947, having appeared in over 50 films and portrayed a wide range of characters, Quinn took on his first leading role in the modestly budgeted Black Gold, where his real-life wife, Catherine, played his on-screen wife. That same year, Quinn became a U.S. citizen. However, with this new nationality came a raft of troubles. His political beliefs led him to consider leaving Hollywood as the House Un-American Activities Committee began its investigations into the entertainment industry. Thanks to a tip-off from Daryl F. Zanuck, head of 20th Century Fox, and a critic of the committee, Quinn was informed about being gray-listed. In short, they were coming for him, and it would be wise to get out of town and hope the storm would blow over. Quinn's lifelong engagement in political activism was already evident when he took a stand during the infamous 1942 Sleepy Lagoon trial by aiding 22 Mexican-American young men, wrongly convicted of a murder in Los Angeles. Quinn told the Los Angeles Times, Probably it's the Irish in me that makes me speak out, but there are about 800 boys in my profession who have a political ideal and want to express it. How can an actor be real in his work if he hasn't had some convictions regarding the problems in the world around him? Choosing not to extend his contract with Paramount, Quinn shifted base to New York City in 1947, making a mark on Broadway in Gentlemen from Athens. His journey continued with a tour of Born Yesterday and an enriching experience at the actor's studio. It was here that Elia Kazan recognized his talent casting him as Stanley Kowalski in A Streetcar Named Desire on Broadway, a role he embodied for nearly two years. He replaced Marlon Brando, who was heading in the other direction, Hollywood bound. Quinn's mixed heritage always deeply influenced his identity and career choices. In a 1981 interview with the Los Angeles Times, Quinn recounted the difficulties of his upbringing. With a name like Quinn, I wasn't totally accepted by the Mexican community in those days. And as a Mexican, I wasn't accepted as an American. So as a kid, I just decided, well, a plague on both your houses. I'll just become a world citizen. So that's what I did. Acting is my nationality. Quinn took pride in accurately portraying Mexicans and Native Americans, aspiring to show them with dignity I fought early to go beyond the stereotypes and demand Mexicans and Indians be treated with dignity in films, he said. Quinn also maintained connections to his Mexican roots, notably with Pancho Villa's widow, Dona Maria Luz Corral. He supported her financially and visited her home in Chihuahua City, which later became the Historical Museum of the Revolution. A photograph of Quinn and Corral is displayed in the museum as a symbol of their friendship. Nevertheless, his relationship with Mexico was always uneasy. He found the lack of acceptance difficult, but it proved to be a motivating force. In an interview given when he was 85, he said, but I must say that I think it was a good thing, if there is such a thing as a good thing, that I wasn't accepted 100% by the Mexican people, because it drove me mad. It drove me absolutely crazy crazy enough to become an actor. Quinn's breakthrough came with his Oscar-winning role in 1952's Viva Zapata, where he portrayed Eufemio Zapata alongside Marlon Brando. This role was a departure from the stereotypical characters he had been confined to and made him the first Mexican-American to win an Academy Award. In 1954, Quinn expanded his film repertoire by starring in two major Italian epics. He collaborated with the famed producers Dino De Laurentiis and Carlo Ponti in Ulysses, alongside Kirk Douglas, and portrayed Attila the Hun in Attila, with Sofia Loren as his co-star. His next major role came in Federico Fellini's masterpiece, La Strada, where Quinn delivered an unforgettable performance as Zampano, a brutish, wandering strongman with a penchant for drinking and women, 
who takes advantage of a naive girl, played by Fellini's wife, Gioletta Massina, forcing her into a life of circus performance. Despite Sampano's harshness, the film eventually unveils his deep-seated loneliness and sorrow. Fellini himself described La Strada as a complete catalog of my entire mythological world, a dangerous representation of my identity that was undertaken with no precedent whatsoever. The making of the film was fraught with challenges, including financial instabilities, casting issues, and multiple setbacks, culminating in Fellini's own nervous breakdown just before the completion of shooting. Despite the initial critical backlash and a contentious debut at the Venice Film Festival, La Strada has since been heralded as a monumental work in cinema, earning the first Academy Award for Best Foreign Language Film in 1957, among countless other accolades. The character of Zampano was inspired by a man from Fellini's childhood in Rimini. Known for his womanizing ways, Fellini explained, this man took all the girls in town to bed with him. Once he left a poor idiot girl pregnant, and everyone said the baby was the devil's child. Quinn eventually accepted the part of Zampano after being convinced by Fellini's persistence. Quinn said, I thought he was a little bit crazy, and I told him I wasn't interested in the picture, but he kept hounding me for days. Roberto Rossellini and Ingrid Bergman then took Quinn to see Fellini's film, E. Vitaloni, and Quinn knew he was dealing with a very special director. I was thunderstruck by it, he said. I told them the film was a masterpiece, and that the same director was the man who had been chasing me for weeks. Filming began in October 1953, but was quickly paused due to Gioletta Massina injuring her ankle in a scene opposite Quinn. This break in production led Dino De Laurentiis to consider replacing Massina, whom he had initially been reluctant to cast, and who hadn't officially been contracted yet. However, after Paramount executives praised Massina's early work in the film, De Laurentiis quickly secured her with a contract albeit for roughly a third of what Quinn was earning. This delay in production created a scheduling dilemma for Quinn, who was already committed to leading in Attila, another 1954 epic under De Laurentiis' banner, and directed by Pietro Franceschi. Initially, Quinn thought about leaving La Strada, but Fellini persuaded him to juggle both projects. Quinn's day started before dawn to meet Fellini's demand for early morning shoots for La Strada, after which he'd raced to Rome in costume to film Attila. Quinn later reflected that the exhausting schedule contributed to his worn-out appearance in both films. This haggard look was fitting for Zampano, but less so for the mighty Attila. Luigi Giacosi, the production supervisor, managed to stretch the film's limited budget to include a small circus led by Savitri, a strong man and fire eater, who tutored Quinn in circus slang and the nuances of breaking chains. Following Attila, Quinn starred in The Magnificent Matador, where he portrayed a celebrated Mexican bullfighter. The director praised Maureen O'Hara's performance and noted his satisfaction not just with the film itself, but with the opportunity it provided Quinn. According to Boddicher, The Magnificent Matador transformed Quinn from a character actor into a leading star. His next project was another success. Lust for Life portrays the turbulent life of Vincent van Gogh, capturing both the genius and agony of the artist. The film paints a vivid portrait of van Gogh, bringing Irving Stone's popular biographical novel to the cinematic canvas was a labor of love for producer John Hausman, spanning nearly 10 years. Lust for Life has authentic European settings, that actually featured in Van Gogh's artwork. Douglas's portrayal won him an Academy Award nomination, while Quinn clinched the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor for his portrayal of Paul Gauguin, Van Gogh's artist friend. Quinn's dynamic range led him to star opposite Italy's most celebrated actresses, including Anna Magnani in Wild as the Wind, Gina Lolo Brigida in The Hunchback of Notre Dame, and Sophia Loren in Black Orchid and Heller in Pink Tights. 
His role in Wild as the Wind earned him another Academy Award nomination, portraying a rancher who marries his late wife's sister from Italy. In 1958, Quinn directed The Buccaneer, taking the reins from his ailing father-in-law, Cecil B. DeMille. Quinn continued to explore unusual roles in Warlock and Last Train from Gun Hill, both acclaimed westerns. He then embraced the challenging role of an Enoch in Nicholas Ray's The Savage Innocence, filmed in the Canadian Arctic. This film was about the Inuit's struggle to preserve their way of life amidst the advance of civilization. The Savage Innocence was noted for its authentic depiction of Inuit culture and the Arctic wilderness. It was honored at the 1960 Cannes Film Festival. Entering the 1960s, Quinn embraced his visible signs of aging. He put on weight, his hair took on shades of gray, and his once smooth, dark complexion acquired a more textured and rugged appearance. His time as a classic leading man may have been coming to an end, but there would be many extraordinary roles still to come for the versatile and gifted Quinn. During the early 60s, Quinn's career soared, both on Broadway and the big screen. On stage, he mesmerized audiences as Henry II and shared the spotlight with Margaret Leighton and Francois Villadeuze's Chin Chin. Concurrently, he enjoyed box office hits with the World War II thriller and Quentin Tarantino favorite, The Guns of Navarone, in which he played a Greek colonel, and David Lean's cinematic masterpiece, Lawrence of Arabia. The Guns of Navarone followed on from the success of other grand World War II spectacles, like The Bridge on the River Kwai and The Longest Day. The story came from Alistair MacLean's best-selling novel. Enthused by the story's film potential, Columbia Pictures' Mike Frankovich kicked off the adaptation. The scenic Greek island of Rhodes served as the shooting location from April to July 1960. This magical place captivated Quinn to the extent that he purchased 100 acres of land there for $50,000 from the Queen of Greece. The spot is now known as Anthony Quinn Bay, but after the deposition of the Greek monarchy and the fall of the military junta in 1973, the New Republic tried to confiscate the land, but Quinn held on tight to it, even though he was barred from building on his land by the Greek government. This fact led him to move to Rhode Island in the 1990s, which he always associated with Rhodes. And like to many who have fallen in love with Greece, he developed a more naturalistic, pagan spirituality, which began to replace and complement his Christian beliefs. He explained, I love Druidism. When I go for a walk where I live in Rhode Island, I know all the trees and all the birds, and they all have names. There's a maple tree right in front of where I have breakfast every morning, and I've fallen in love with it. It's just a wonderful tree. The tree and I have now become close friends, and it tells me its history. But back in the 1960s, Lawrence of Arabia not only clinched the Oscar and Golden Globe for Best Picture, but also garnered Quinn a Golden Globe nomination for his role. The film is celebrated as a cinematic landmark, recognized by the United States Library of Congress in 1991 for its significant cultural, historical, and aesthetic value, and included in the National Film Registry. Quinn dove deep into his portrayal of Auda Abu Tayyi. He spent hours meticulously applying his makeup to resemble the historical figure closely, and kept a photo of Tai with him at all times. A humorous mix-up occurred when director Lean mistook Quinn in full costume as a local on his first day on set and told an interpreter to inform the extra to go home as he was going to be replaced. Another standout role came with Requiem for a Heavyweight, where Quinn played an aging boxer named Mountain Rivera, adapted from Rod Serling's original teleplay for Playhouse 90. The film featured Quinn as a once promising boxer, now exploited by his manager, portrayed by Jackie Gleason. Julie Harris played a social worker who becomes enamored with Rivera, encouraging him to seek a new path. Serling's boxing background lent authenticity to the narrative, 
with the ensemble cast, including Mickey Rooney, and a young Muhammad Ali, then known as Cassius Clay, receiving widespread acclaim for their compelling performances. For his role in Barabbas, a production spearheaded by Dino De Laurentiis, Anthony Quinn once again took on a leading role, this time in a film steeped in biblical history. The shooting took place in the historical settings of Verona and Rome, featuring grandiose scenes such as a gladiatorial battle in a replica of the Colosseum built at Chinachita Studios, and a spectacular crucifixion sequence timed with a real total solar eclipse. The film premiered in Italy on December 23, 1961, and later in the United States through Columbia Pictures on October 10, 1962. It won accolades in Italy and was met with widespread acclaim from critics globally. During his time in Paris, Quinn, along with other notable Americans, contributed to drafting a petition in support of the 1963 March on Washington. This document aimed to mobilize American expatriates in favor of the march. His views were broadcast on French TV, alongside other American expats in the City of Light, including singers Memphis Slim and Mae Mercer, and the writer James Baldwin. But his political activism would be set aside for his next project, which would become the best known of his career. Quinn's portrayal in Zorba the Greek became iconic. As Alexis Zorba, he embodied a man brimming with zeal for life. In the film, Zorba goes through the trials of establishing a lignite mine in a Cretan village. The film culminates in a celebratory dance among the unfolding chaos. Produced on a modest budget of under $1 million in Greece, Zorba achieved huge success, notably fetching over nine times its cost in the U.S. market. The film secured Academy Awards for Best Supporting Actress, Best Cinematography, and Best Art Direction, with nominations extending to Best Picture, Best Director, and Best Actor for Quinn. His role also introduced the world to the Sirtaki dance. Quinn credits himself for creating the film's iconic dance due to a practical necessity. Having broken his foot just before filming, he discovered that dragging it minimized pain. This improvised movement, coupled with a traditional Greek pose, became the famous Sirtaki. Filmed in black and white on Crete's picturesque locales like Chania, Kokino Chorio, and Stavros' Beach, the movie's authentic backdrop added to its charm. In 1965, Anthony Quinn's nearly three-decade-long marriage to Catherine DeMille came to an end, following his relationship with Yolanda Adolori, whom he met on the set of Barabbas in 1962. Quinn's marital fidelity was notoriously absent. He had liaisons with several of Hollywood's leading ladies, including Carol Lombard, Rita Hayworth, Ingrid Bergman, and Maureen O'Hara. He would later describe Hayworth as the only woman he ever met that he considered both beautiful and interesting. He and Adelori tied the knot in 1966 while expecting their third child together. But Quinn's inclination towards multiple relationships didn't stop with Adelori. He had romantic entanglements with figures such as French actress Dominique Sanda and Pia Lindstrom, the daughter of Ingrid Bergman, who he had previously slept with. During the mid-60s, Quinn continued to portray a wide variety of characters across different cultures, including the Mongol Emperor Kublai Khan and Marco the Magnificent. Lieutenant Colonel Pierre Noel Raspugai, a French Basque in lost command, and even a Transylvanian peasant, mistaken for Jewish by the Nazis, in the 25th hour. The Magus, a British mystery film directed by Guy Green in 1968, turned out to be a critical flop. Despite being based on John Fowle's successful novel, and having Fowle himself pen the screenplay, the film was widely panned, with Fowles blaming Green for the failure. Michael Caine, co-starring in the film, echoed the sentiment, calling it the worst film he ever worked on. 
For his role, Quinn went to the length of shaving his head and curiously ensuring his hair against the possibility it wouldn't grow back. In 1969, Quinn showed his support for Native American student activists by visiting their occupation of Alcatraz Island and offering his assistance. His role in the savage innocence also inspired The Mighty Quinn, a song by Bob Dylan that Manfred Mann's Earth Band popularized. He garnered a Golden Globe nomination for his performance in The Secret of Santa Vittoria and starred alongside tragic Inger Stevens in her final film, A Dream of Kings, where he played yet another Greek character, Matsukas. In 1970, Quinn appeared as a progressive sociology professor, an RPM, opposite Anne Margaret, and portrayed a Smoky Mountains recluse in A Walk in the Spring Rain, and this was Ingrid Bergman's return to American cinema after two decades. In 1972, Anthony Quinn shared the screen with Yafit Koto in the influential film Across 110th Street in the role of NYPD captain Frank Martelli. The plot weaves through a robbery and the murder investigation of gang members in Harlem, the movie known for its gripping narrative that combines elements of black exploitation and film noir, also gained fame for its evocative soundtrack, highlighted by Bobby Womack's titular song. Quinn, who also took on the role of executive producer, initially eyed John Wayne and later Kirk Douglas for Captain Mattelli's character, but ended up assuming the role himself after others declined. Sidney Poitier was his first choice for Lieutenant Pope, but community feedback from Harlem suggested Poitier didn't fit the urban authenticity they desired. So Yafet Koto was cast. The film's director, Barry Shear, insisted on shooting on location to authentically capture the essence of gang conflict and the stark realities of street life. As Quinn approached his 60s, he noticed a decline in acting opportunities, coinciding with his own diminishing interest in pursuing such roles. He said, The parts dried up as I reached my 60th birthday, loosely coinciding with my growing disinclination to pursue them. Indeed, I could not see the point in playing old men on screen when I rejected the role for myself. This period allowed Quinn to focus more on his passions for the arts, including painting, sculpting, and jewelry design. His artwork influenced by Cubism and Post-Impressionism was shown worldwide. In an interview with the San Francisco Chronicle, he quoted Picasso, a poor man borrows, a rich artist steals. I steal, of course. He considered his art a truer expression of himself than his extensive film career, as detailed in his autobiography, The Original Sin, a self-portrait. He explained, I'm much more honest in my painting than I am as an actor. You can't do 240 films and do your best in each one. In his personal life during his marriage to Adelori, Quinn fathered two children with Friedel Dunbar, an event organizer in Los Angeles, further complicating his already complex family life. Despite the challenges and changing tides of his career in the 1970s, Quinn continued to act, appearing in notable films such as The Greek Tycoon and The Children of Sanchez towards the end of the decade. In the closing years of the 1970s, Anthony Quinn took center stage in The Message as Hamza and in Lion of the Desert, embodying Omar Mukhtar, who valiantly fought against Italian colonial forces in Libya. These roles not only elevated Quinn's status in the Middle East, but also reignited his self-esteem, with Quinn later acknowledging the profound influence of Muslim faith on his career revival. Producing The Message, a film set against the backdrop of Islam's early days, presented an audacious challenge at the time. Despite facing a hostile reception initially, The Message would later be recognized as a pioneering cinematic exploration of Islamic history, receiving accolades and nominations, including for Maurice Jarre's score at the 50th Academy Awards. 
The journey to bring the message to the silver screen was fraught with difficulties, from obtaining script approval to facing production halts and public controversies. Akkad's meticulous approach to respecting Islamic traditions while crafting the film faced backlash. Financial support from Libyan leader Muammar al-Gaddafi enabled the project's completion. In July 1976, merely days before its scheduled debut in London's West End, threatening calls to a cinema led Akkad to rename the film from Mohammed, Messenger of God, to The Message. Incurring a hefty $50,000 expense, the movie faced bans in Egypt, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia. When it was time for the U.S. premiere, the Hanafi movement, a faction of the Nation of Islam, launched a siege on the Washington, D.C. Benai B'rith chapter, erroneously believing Anthony Quinn portrayed Muhammad in the film. In fact, Akkad chose to use a light bulb illuminated on screen to represent the presence of the Prophet. Nonetheless, the group demanded the premiere's cancellation, threatening to bomb the theater. Consequently, the film's release was temporarily halted, only to resume after the standoff concluded. Akkad was prepared to show the movie to the Hanafi Muslims, even offering to scrap the film if it offended them. The siege, tragically culminating in the deaths of a journalist and a police officer, ended. Yet the film's potential success in the U.S. market was permanently marred by the incident. Anthony Quinn found himself playing a Greek once again in The Greek Tycoon, a film that was inspired by the life of Aristotle Onassis. Although he had obtained the shipping magnet's blessing for the film, Onassis passed away before the film was made, and Quinn's decision to continue with the project caused a lifelong rift between him and his close friend, former First Lady Jackie Onassis. Then at 68, he returned to one of his most beloved roles in Zorba, the Broadway musical adaptation. He reprised his role as Zorba, sharing the stage with Leela Kedrova, who returned as Madame Hortense. Quinn played both Broadway and the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., with his performance in the role for 362 shows. Quinn had been engaging in painting and sculpting from a young age, but it wasn't until the 1980s that he realized these passions could evolve into a secondary career. He had always created small sculptures from materials found on movie sets across North Africa and the Middle East. In the 80s, he began scaling these maquettes into larger sculptures, primarily to decorate his own living spaces. To his amazement, this artistry caught the eye of potential buyers, and he was soon offered a solo exhibition in Honolulu, Hawaii, where he successfully sold every piece on display. Even as he continued his acting career, Quinn would spend his leisure time combing through dunes, collecting stones, rocks, and wood scraps. Between filming scenes and during breaks, he transformed these seemingly mundane materials into artworks. In 1987, Quinn was honored with the Cecil B. DeMille Award, a prestigious Golden Globe Award recognizing outstanding contributions to the world of entertainment. During his acceptance speech, he reminisced about his early encounters with DeMille and how his role in The Plainsman catalyzed his astonishing career. Quinn kept working into the 1990s with memorable roles in Spike Lee's Jungle Fever and a walk in the clouds, showing no signs of diminishing talent. He held a particular fondness for his co-star Keanu Reeves in A Walk in the Clouds. Throughout his early career, Quinn often expressed his disappointment at not being cast in romantic lead roles, humorously stating in a 1993 interview with Julie Greenwald of People, I never get the girl. This comment was surely made tongue-in-cheek given his history with countless lovers and five wives. In 1996, Quinn, at the ripe age of 80, welcomed a son and daughter with Kathy Benvin, his former secretary, shortly after undergoing heart surgery and enduring a bitter divorce from Yolanda. This brought his total to 13 children with five different women. He was living out his real-life role as a prolific father 
in many ways mirroring the nurturing figures he often portrayed on screen. Quinn took great pride in his extensive family, especially delighted by the choice of acting careers by three of his sons. He enjoyed a good relationship with all of his children, but after the heart surgery, he felt even closer to them. He explained how an interview with one of his sons initially annoyed him, but then led him to a revelation about these extra years he had been granted on Earth. He said, I got angry at one of my sons, who wrote in the newspaper that I was a different man, that he had seen me someplace and he thought I had a lobotomy. And I said, are you saying I needed a lobotomy? He said, Pop, I've never seen you like this, so I guess I've gotten younger. Some miracles happened. During the shooting of Terra de Canons in Brazil's southern region in 1998, Quinn expressed a desire to adopt Maria Rosa da Silva, an 11-year-old local girl he encountered during an autograph session. He felt a connection with her, explaining to her that he believed they shared a past life together, a statement echoing the film's reincarnation theme. He offered to finance her education abroad, an opportunity the girl's mother had considered seriously, given her wish for her daughter to escape their impoverished fishing village. Quinn left his contact information, but no further communication ensued after filming wrapped up. Quinn's cinematic journey concluded with Avenging Angelo, featuring Sylvester Stallone, shot in Toronto in May 2001. By this time, the great actor was beginning to finally show signs that his almighty vitality was drying up. He began to think about the end not only of his career, but of his life. In an interview in 2000, he said, In my will I had left that I wanted to be buried in Mexico. They would take me up to the top of a mountain in Chihuahua and leave me there, on a rock. I was really comfortable about that. But when I was there in April, a friend asked me if I wanted to see the place and he flew me out in a helicopter. It was 175 miles away. My wife said, how the hell am I going to bring you flowers when you're so far away? So I had to think of another place. Now it's Rhode Island, under the tree. A month after shooting wrapped on Avenging Angelo, Quinn passed away due to respiratory failure at 86 years old. Though he had been in the U.S. from a young age, the actor born in Mexico rarely portrayed an American character, unless it was Native American. His roles spanned a diverse range of nationalities, including Greek, Mexican, French, Italian, Arab, and even an Enoch. Quinn wasn't just known for his robust on-screen personas. He was equally vibrant off-screen, yet his life was far more complex than the roles he played. He is buried on the Quinn family estate in Bristol, Rhode Island. That's all from this episode of Hollywood Mysteries. Sweet dreams. Yeah.